OK, so on the remaining 24 minutes, we can cover it, I think. Do you want to cover it? It should be fun, yeah. Because you're actually, everything we said so far, uh, you're not dealing with. <laughs> There's somebody else that is taking the addresses that you put into your program and translating it for you. And that's the idea of virtual memory. It's all, it's all virtualized, basically, to you as a programmer. And uh, chapter 8, 8.4 8 has this reading. Uh, as we've discussed, I've shown you the slide before. Programmer's view of memory looks like this. You do loads and stores to memory, to individual addresses. Ideal memory has infinite capacity. Clearly, we cannot have infinite capacity, so how do we give that illusion to the programmer? So this is the slide that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you have virtual memory versus physical memory. What the programmer sees is this illusion of infinite capacity memory, or large enough capacity memory. It's called virtual memory. You can assume the memory is infinite. Infinite meaning it's really large. Uh, reality is physical memory size is much smaller than what the programmer assumes. And virtual memory, the whole concept is the system. System software and the hardware cooperatively map virtual memory addresses uh, to, uh, to physical memory. OK, this R is not correct over here. So it's bothering me, and I'll fix it. This looks better, right? OK, I think so. I don't know where, how that R came there. <laughs> OK, now it's gone. OK, basically, the system automatically manages the physical memory space transparently to the programmer, which means that the programmer doesn't need to know the physical size of memory at all, nor does, uh, do they need to manage it. Uh, as a result, you can have a small physical memory that can appear very large, uh, and life is easier for the programmer. We've covered this slide before. But the downside is you get more complex system software and architecture. So we're going to talk about especially the architectural implications because we don't have time for the system software implications of it. Uh, let's take a look at it. But this is a classic example of programmer microarchitect trade-off. So what are the benefits of automatic management of memory? Why do we want to do that? Basically, we don't want programmer to deal with physical addresses. That's one of the big benefits. Each process has its own mapping from virtual to physical addresses. That's another benefit because these are, uh, let's assume that you have different processes running on a machine. How do you ensure that different programmers don't write to the same physical memory location? This program, if, 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 you're, if you're directly writing to physical memory location, you can decide, oh, I'm going to write to location 8. And this other program can decide, oh, they're going to write to location 8 also. And these 8s have nothing to do with each other. They're completely different processes, right? So if you actually have a management layer, automatic management layer, you can actually fix that. So this enables, automatic management enables code and data to be located anywhere in physical memory because you can actually take a virtual address and map it anywhere you want. Whereas if you didn't have this, the programmer has to specify, oh, code goes here, data goes here, and nobody else should do, some other process should not really touch it, right? That's a very hard thing to do. So relocation benefits. Uh, and whenever you load the program again, it could go somewhere else. Whenever you load the program again, it could go somewhere else, right? And I've discussed this already, basically isolation and separation of code and data of different processes uh, in physical memory. This should be memory. I don't know why I have these mistakes over here, but hopefully Juan will help me fix it. This should be physical memory. Basically, you get protection and isolation. This will become a little bit more clear. And you get code and data sharing between multiple processes. So you could actually enable that sharing. You could say, oh, this process wants to access this address. This other process wants to access this address. You could map them to the same physical location. OK, let's go. Uh, this is a high level. So let's go into an example. This is, the exa this is what we've been assuming so far, a system with physical memory only. This is not the state of the art. You don't have it in your CPUs. Basically, CPU generates physical addresses, and directly you access memory. That's not true. It used to be true. Well, in some systems, it's true, actually. In most embedded systems, it's true, because you need to have some predictable performance, but there are other reasons uh, why it's not true. Even they are moving to virtual memory as they employ more multi-core or multi-process systems. So the problem is physical memory is of limited size because of cost reasons. So what if you need more? Should the programmer be concerned about the size of the code and data blocks fitting the physical memory? Should the programmer manage data movement from disk to physical memory? What if you run out of physical memory? Should the programmer ensure two processes, different programs do not use the same physical memory? How do you even do that, right? You didn't even program it. Somebody else really needs to do that. Because you, you may program uh, program A, somebody else may program program B. They happen to run in the same machine. 
And if you assign the same physical addresses, you could easily, they will clash with each other. That sounds bad. You don't have protection or isolation of the different processes. And punting on the programmer is definitely not a good idea. And also, this is lesser of an issue, but it's still an issue. I'll briefly talk about it. ISA can have an address space that's greater than the physical memory size. So you can have a 64-bit address space with byte addressability. But if you do not have enough physical memory, somebody needs to naturally manage this anyway. So if you have direct physical addressing, there are a bunch of uh, difficulties. Programmer needs to manage the physical address space. This is inconvenient and hard, and harder when you have multiple processes. It's difficult to support code and data relocation if you're programming, uh, loading the program at one time, at another time, and they need to go to different places for whatever reason, you cannot do that, because addresses are directly specified in the program. And it's difficult to support multiple processes, as we've discussed, and it's difficult to support code and data sharing across processes, which I'm not going to go into, but uh, it is difficult. So virtual memory, the simple idea is make life easier for the programmer. Give the programmer the illusion of a large address space while having a, physical a small physical memory so that the programmer doesn't worry about managing this physical memory. And they can assume that uh, you have an infinite amount of physical memory, and hardware and software cooperatively maintain that illusion. They automatically manage the physical memory space to provide the illusion. And illusion is maintained for each independent process, which means that you need to do different management for different processes. So the basic mechanism in which you achieve this is indirection. So we've covered the principle of locality in caches. Principle of indirection is also very, very powerful in uh, computer systems. Basically, you don't directly address memory. You go through an indirection layer. And that indirection layer is essentially a virtual memory management layer. So you have indirection in addresses. What you have in your program is virtual. It's not physical. And there's an indirection, a mapping layer between the virtual and the physical. So address generated by each instruction in the program is a virtual address. Uh, i.e. it's not the physical address used to really address the hardware. It's also called a linear address in x86, uh, which may or may not be good terminology. An address translation mechanism maps this address to a physical address. It's called a real address in x86. This is good terminology. <laughs> I like the real address. What is real, virtual versus real, right? Linear is kind of odd. Uh, address translation mechanism can be implemented in hardware and the software together. And we'll see why you need hardware support for it. You could actually imagine software doing it, but that's a lot of overhead, as we will see. OK, so this is basically what's happening. As opposed to having a CPU generating physical addresses and you directly accessing memory, there's this indirection layer called the page table that essentially stores where each virtual address is mapped in physical address space. Basically, this is called the address translation process. When the CPU generates a virtual address, it consults this virtual memory management unit page table, let's say, uh, the hardware, software, cooperatively, they convert virtual addresses into physical addresses via this lookup table called the page table. And this page table is maintained by the operating system in the memory and in the disk, because it's huge, actually, as we will see. Uh, and uh, you need this to actually get to the physical address that's corresponding to the virtual address. So what this, if you look at this picture, uh, for some virtual addresses, some of the virtual addresses are in physical memory, as you can see. Some of them are actually in disk. So that's what this page table enables. You generate a virtual address. Uh, the page table says, oh, you should access this physical location. You get it quickly. You generate a virtual address. It's not in physical memory because the page table says it's in disk. It's not in physical memory. Then you get a, what is called a page fault. Essentially, that page is not in physical memory. So somebody needs to bring that page from the disk into the main memory. And that somebody is a system software and hardware together. OK, but this way, you can have the illusion of a huge virtual address space while your memory is small. Essentially, you can have the illusion of the entire disk space or whatever you have over there, huge tape space, for example. Uh, but your memory can be really small. OK. So let's define some terminology. I've been saying pages, for example. Virtual address space is actually divided into pages. And physical address space is divided into frames. You could call them pages also. I like calling them frames. A virtual page is mapped to a physical frame if the page is in physical memory. Basically, if you go back to this picture, this virtual page over here uh, that's generated by the virtual address is mapped to this physical frame over here. 
because the address is in uh, memory, main physical memory. As opposed to this one, this virtual page, uh, you try to access this virtual address over here, the page table says it's not here, but the page table tells you where to find it. And you find it in, on the disk. Okay, basically a virtual page is mapped to a location in disk if the page is not in physical memory. And usually pages are large sized. For example, four kilobytes or eight kilobyte sizes are common for pages. Today we have large pages also, two gigabyte pages uh, that, that, are, that are mapped uh, that way. So if an access virtual page is not in memory but on disk, the virtual memory system brings uh, the page into the physical frame and adjusts the mapping. This is called demand paging. You may see that in your courses. Uh, basically on demand you page uh, from the disk into uh, the physical memory. And page table is a table that stores the mapping of virtual pages to physical frames. Hopefully that's clear. Basically physical memory, in other words, physical memory acts like a cache for the disk, if you think about it. Right? And our terminology will be very similar. Physical memory is a cache for pages stored on the disk. In fact, it is a fully associative cache in modern systems. A virtual page can potentially be mapped to any physical frame. Basically, if your physical memory is not enough, you send it to disk. And disk can contain a lot of physical pages. And then when you need to access that page again, you bring it into the physical memory. So essentially, your physical memory is a cache. Right? This way, you have the illusion of the entire disk space in your memory but you, you don't have that much memory. So basically, you have similar caching issues that exist as we have covered earlier. You have the disk, you have the physical memory, and physical memory is a cache of the disk. Now, where and how do you place or find a page in the cache in physical memory? What page do you remove to make room in your physical memory if you run out of physical memory, right? And you can run out of physical memory. Do you have large pages, small pages, or uniform pages, granularity of management? We had the same issue for block size in a cache. We'll have the same issue over here. What is the write policy? What do we do about the writes? Whenever you, we write to a page in physical memory, do we do write through, write back? Or do we bring sub pages into uh, physical memory? So all of the same issues actually exist between physical memory and the disk as they exist between L1, L2, L3, and physical memory. So, and this is the terminology basically, these are the analogs. In cache we had the block, in virtual memory we had the page. Block size corresponds to page size, that's the analog. Block offset, which is which byte in the block that you're accessing, similar to the page offset, which byte in the page that you really want. A miss in the cache, a miss in physical memory is essentially a page fault, or physical memory miss, but we don't say that. We say it's a page fault. And the tag in the cache is essentially a virtual page number in virtual memory. Just, let's take a look at this now. Uh, well, I'll give you a little bit more definitions. Page size is the amount of memory transferred from hard disk to DRAM at once. That's the size of the page. Address translation, we already said that, and page table, we already said that. Basically, it's a lookup table used to translate virtual addresses to physical addresses. Basically, we're going to do this. This is another picture. The hope is that most of your accesses sit in physical memory. Right? For this to work really well, you don't want a lot of page faults. You want most of your accesses to hit in this cache, which is physical memory. But you still see the large capacity of virtual memory. And address translation's job is to actually map the virtual addresses to physical addresses. As long as most of your accesses hit here, and only once in a while you need to access hard disk, that's good. If you need to access the hard disk a lot, then you have a problem clearly, right? And whenever your machine does that, I'm sure you may be aware of that. So this is what the translation looks like. You, you get a virtual address. In this case, it's 31 bits. In modern systems, it could be 64 bits. They're very large, actually. Uh, and uh, in this case, I'm assuming a page size of four kilobytes, as you can see in a byte addressable machine. That's the page offset, 12 bytes. That's four kilo, uh, 12, 12 bits here. That's four, that specifies four kilobytes. And page offset stays constant, but you translate the virtual page number to a physical frame number or physical page number. That's the translation process. Now this gives the flexibility to the virtual memory management system to map any virtual page number to any physical frame number. You just do the mapping through this translation process, which is essential to the page table. Right. So you need to maintain that page table as a system. Okay, let's take a look at an example. Let's, uh, let's, have, let's assume that we have a virtual memory size that's really small by today's standards, two to 31 bytes. Let's assume that uh, two gigabytes. Physical memory size is two to 27 bytes. 
Let's assume that our page size is four kilobytes to so 12 bytes. Uh, virtual address in this case is 31 bytes. Physical address is 27 bytes, obvious, right? Page offset is only 12 bits, which means that the number of virtual pages you have is uh, the size of virtual pa uh, page number, 31 minus 12, and two to the power of that. That's two to the 19, right? And your virtual page number is 19 bits. And the size of your uh, physical, uh, the number of physical pages you have is two to the 27 minus 12, which is two to the 15, right? So hopefully this is obvious. And your physical frame number or physical page number is 15 bits, which is essentially putting uh, the same example over here in words. Okay, now you can get away with a small memory, right? As long as you have virtual addresses that are 31 bits. So this is an example. Uh, I'm not going to go through, through this in detail, but as you can see, you have a bunch of virtual addresses over here, and this is your physical memory, and the blue ones over here are mapped to uh, the physical memory. So how do we translate the address? Let's take a look at how we translate the address. So page table has an entry for each virtual page, and given a virtual page number, you index to that entry and get the physical frame number or physical page number. To be able to do that, you need to have multiple things in each page table entry. The first thing is a valid bit. Now it's going to look similar to a cache also again, right? Because this is a cache. Whether the virtual page is located in physical memory, whether it's in the cache or not. Otherwise, it must be fetched from the hard disk, as we know. So if you get an invalid, that means you have a page fault and you need to fetch the page from the hard disk into the physical memory and you need to put, set the valid bit to one. And also you need the tag, which is the physical page number where the page is located, right? That way you can do the translation. And you also need replacement policy bits, dirty bits, very similar to a cache. Because if you're written to physical memory, you need to say, oh, this is dirty, this is modified. And because you don't want to actually, whenever you write to physical memory, you don't want to write into the disk also. That's very expensive, right? Usually physical memory is managed uh, with, as a write back cache. Okay. So let's take a look at this example over here. This is a cooked up page table. Uh, this is index zero over here. And it's, uh, I can tell you how many entries there are. Basically, it has two to the 19 entries, which is a lot, as you can see. And I didn't even assume a huge virtual address here. It's a 31-bit virtual address, right? And now our page table is two to the 31 uh, entries. And each entry may be four bytes, for example. That's a lot. So how do you manage this page table is a question. But let's, take, let's assume that it's there. and we want to, we got a virtual address and we want to translate it to a physical address. What do we do? We take the virtual page number, separate it from the offset, and use uh, the virtual page number to index into the page table. In this case, this is two, zero, one, two, assuming you're starting from the bottom. And what we get is a valid uh, page table entry, and we have the physical page number, physical frame number, and what we do is take that physical frame number, concatenate it, with the page offset. So this address, 000247C, translates to 7FFF47C, uh, because you hit in the page table, because uh, the page table entry you indexed was valid. So hopefully this is obvious. This is very similar to a cache, right? Except it's used for translation in this case. What it caches is the page table, uh, yeah, what it caches is the, uh, the locations uh, of uh, this virtual page. Okay, so a page table example. Uh, so what is the uh, physical address uh, of virtual address 0x5f20 over here? We do the same thing. We basically take the address, figure out what's the virtual page number, index the page table. It's a hit in the page table, and the physical address is translated by concatenating the physical frame number, physical page number, with the page offset. So that's your physical address. Now let's take a look at another example, 0x73E0. We take this, figure out what's the virtual page number, we index the page table, access the page table, page table says I don't have a valid mapping, which means that this is not in physical memory, this is not in the cache. And it has some other information saying where you could find it on the disk. We're not gonna talk about that, but there needs to be some other information that's stored over here that says, oh, this is where you can find it on the disk, and go and figure it out. <laughs> and at that point, the operating system actually manages. So one issue with the page table is the page table size. Let's take a look at a much bigger example, which is more representative of today's systems, right? 
Let's assume that you have a 64-bit address and your page offset is only 12 bits. You have a virtual page number that's 52 bits. How many entries do you have in the page table? Two to the 52. That's a huge number. Right? If you, what, is, how, what is the size of the page table? Well, the page table needs to store at least 28 bits uh, for the physical address, physical page number, plus some other bits. Let's assume that you have about four bytes. So the size of the page table is 2 to the 54. That's really huge, which means that you cannot store it in physical memory. You really need to store it on the disk. So what modern processors actually do is they page the page tables in. <laughs> so they have pointers to the page table also. So we're not going to get into that. Uh, and this is because this is just for uh, the one process, 2 to the 54 bytes for one, one process. If you have 100 processes, you need to multiply this by 100. OK, so basically, one of the challenges is page table is large. At least part of it needs to be located in physical memory, and the operating system needs to manage it. But we're not going to get into this. Uh, it's fun, but we don't have time. But there's another issue. Each load and store requires at least two memory accesses right now, right? Before, if you had physical addresses, you could just go to memory. But now, you need to first take the virtual address, go to the page table, translate the address, now you have the physical address. Now you go and find the data at that physical address. What we've done is we've doubled, at least doubled actually, uh, the number of accesses that we do for a given load or store. This sounds terrible, right? Because we tried to minimize the access latency. But now we've added virtual memory for the convenience of the programmer. But now we've doubled the number of accesses we're doing. In fact, instruction. You're trying to fetch an instruction. It's a virtual address. You cannot fetch the instruction without doing two main memory accesses. Right. You first need to translate the program counter, which is a virtual address. You go through the page table. It gives you a physical address. And then you take that and access the physical memory with it. This sounds bad. So two memory accesses to service a load store or even an instruction program counter degrades load store execution time, unless we're clever. And what does clever mean? Clever means adding more caching. Basically, if you heard about translation look aside buffers, that's essentially a cache of the page table entries that is stored in the processor. The idea is to cache the page table entries in a hardware structure in the processor. It's called the translation look aside buffer. It's a small cache of most recently used translations, page table entries. It reduces the number of memory accesses required for most loads and stores to only one. Basically, you don't go to the memory to access the page table, you first search the TLB. And you hit in the TLB for most of the time because page table accesses have a lot of temporal locality. Data accesses have temporal and spatial locality if you have a large page size or large enough page size. Consecutive loads and stores are likely to access the same page. So you translate it the first time, you go to the page table, cache it into, cache that translation for that virtual page inside the TLB. And then the next access, uh, next load instruction ad accesses it, and it finds the translation in the TLB. So you don't need to do the translation again and again and again. TLB does it for you. So TLB is usually small. It's accessed in one cycle. Sometimes it could be longer, but you really want one cycle here so that you don't waste. And it's typically this many entries and dot, dot, dot. But basically, this is one example of a true entry TLB. It's like a cache. It's no different from the caches that we've seen, except it doesn't cache data. It caches page table entries. OK, I think you can study the re remaining slides on your own if you're interested. But this is where we're going to stop. We'll see you tomorrow for, uh, <laughs> for, for the review session. I won't be here, unfortunately. But I wish you the best over the summer. Hopefully, you relax a little bit as well, in addition to studying for the exams. <laughs> but if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me and Juan and other TAs. So enjoy the review session and enjoy the summer afterwards. <laughs>